So if we talk about possible reasons for some of the performance of charter schools, there's a number of things. One, I think, is today that it's so much driven by the privatization of profits. 10 to 15 percent of uh, the revenues that go to charter schools are handed over to these private companies uh, in terms of fees. Many of the nonprofit EMOs have similar contract structures. In fact, a recent study I did with Bruce Baker at Rutgers University, we were looking at um, uh, also looking at uh, non nonprofit EMOs. They have much higher salaries in the nonprofit EMOs, uh, the leaders of those entities, and even the the the, the, the private uh, for profit uh, companies. So it's not just just because they're nonprofit EMOs doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be benevolent and not have profit motives, um, as we've seen. But this is one thing I think that's been stifling the charter school reforms is because so much of it is uh, the revenues are being uh, siphoned off. Um, Another thing is a strong advocacy by the charter schools, and I know this may seem, seem strange, but the charter school establishment has a great national network of state agencies, advocacy groups, and a national adv advocacy group. And it's very effective at lobbying. Um, and that has been so effective that the signal that some of the schools aren't performing well, that they need to be cautious about governance and transparency issues, uh, that signal doesn't reach schools, in part because they are so effective uh, with with uh, controlling and, and circulating information. So they are very, very effective at, at that. So I think that even the effective lobbying has been hurting the charter schools because I think they need, they need to hear that they're not, that the performance isn't great. They need to hear that they need to do better in some of these areas. But that signal doesn't reach it because it's become a very polarizing political uh, uh, you know, topic in terms of school reform. I mentioned before another possible reason their performance is not great is attrition. Attrition, and we found this in our, in our big federal study on what's a uh, correlates of success in charter schools, not only attrition of teachers, but also attrition of administrators. We could see that relationship with schools that were struggling, often high turnover of administrators. Um, another factor that we've seen that explains some of the poor performance in charter schools is a rapid rate of growth. Um, I've done a couple state evaluations that have been the most positive. In fact, in Delaware and in Connecticut, I've been attacked by the public school establishment as being pro-charter school. And one uh, editorial accused me in the paper, accused me of looking at charter schools through rose-colored glasses. But the reality is, in some states, charter schools are doing better than others. And what, what I've seen is that the states where the reforms grow more slowly, uh, they tended to perform better. In states like Michigan and Ohio, uh, we ramped up our charter school reforms so quickly that before they could raise the bar in terms of the quality of applications, so many schools were allowed to open uh, with, without, with very poor plans. And uh, in both Michigan and Ohio today, the reforms are largely controlled by the for-profit companies today that operate most of the schools. In Michigan, 79% uh, of our charter schools are run by for-profit companies, 11% by non-profit companies, uh, organizations, and only 10% are independent, what I would call the real charter schools, uh, you know, because they are independent, locally run. Um, so I think this rapid growth is one one secret that we saw also in Connecticut and Delaware. They grew the reform very slowly. They had time to um, usher in new uh, routines for oversight and uh, adjust funding mechanisms uh, and other things. So that they could growing more slowly. They were able to keep m monitor and, and better control the reform. Just, I want to sum up uh, uh, just a couple of my greatest concerns about charter schools today. You know, one is the privatization I mentioned. Uh, and if we look at Ohio and Michigan are extreme in terms of for-profit companies and so forth. But if we look at the nation as a whole, um, right now we have close to 40% of the public charter schools are privately owned and operated. These schools are much larger than average relative to the, especially the mom and pop charter schools. They enroll close to 50% of the nation's public charter school students. So by next year, our projection is that by, by 2017, more than half of the nation's public charter school students are actually in private, privately owned and operated charter schools. Um, and that's a far cry from the charter school idea. These were going to be public schools. They were going to be locally run. And they were going to be flexible and be better able to use resources to serve the needs of their local communities. Uh, and we don't see that today. So this notion of privatization, this is a real concern of mine. Uh, the, the latest study I did documents also about public stripping, of, uh, the stripping of public assets, how that's done systematically in Delaware and other states where these entities come in, even public facilities, public properties are handed over to the public charter school board that then sells it to the private company. 
and then of course leases it from the private company. Uh, we're seeing, uh, when we look systematically at these schools, the equipment, um, the computers, the desk, everything is privately owned. Uh, the names of these schools are proprietary. So even when boards are fired up and feel motivated that we need to throw off these shackles, we need to be rid of these uh, private companies, they can't because the contracts that they signed when they were invited by the company to be board members, the first contract they signed, it says you know that, that it stipulates con conditions of the school, which is basically the management company is going to operate the whole school and the board is more or less, a, they believe they're advisory. They don't understand that they have legal and financial responsibility as a public board. So that's a big concern of mine, uh, privatization. Another one is the notion of segregation and that's happening. There are some pretty exciting examples of some schools in the nation that go out of their way to, uh, to uh, recruit from all segments of the community. Uh, Connecticut has gone so far, to, in part from a, a court case, but each charter school is required to do a recruitment plan on how they're going to market themselves to every segment of the community. Uh, they, they're not allowed to, to uh, invite uh, uh, or select students based on their racial background or family income or anything like that, but they want to get more students, a diverse population, into the candidates of applicants so that they can do a lottery and get a more diverse population. So there's some exceptions to that, but in, in the nation as a whole, this is still a concern. The last concern I will bring up is about the online schools. And I thought that the private companies operating, you know, the brick and mortar charter schools were becoming increasingly scandalous. Um, and now you have to your south in Tennessee and to your north in, in, in Ohio, uh, uh, just um, a plague of these online charter schools. And they're run by for-profit companies. And they are, uh, we've been doing some research on them over the years. They are across the board atrocious. Graduation rates, one third of what district schools have. Um, attrition rates, even in their own, in the, the words they said, the reason our students perform so poorly is the students don't stay. So you can't hold us accountable for outcomes. Wait a second, did you just say that in your annual report that the problem is that students don't stay? I thought these are schools of choice. You know, people are voting with their feet, but they recruit, uh, like K-12 Incorporated, they spend a large portion of their money on recruiting. And they generate at, you know, they can, they can serve large numbers of students for very little unit cost, uh, uh, very low unit cost price. So they're delivering online instruction to students across the nation, many of them that don't have an adult in the household even. Uh, and many of these students don't have the metacognitive skills to succeed, which is really, students need to be a little bit older, they need to have a structured learning environment, they need to have an adult in the house, and they need to you know, be able to self-regulate. Uh, and this company is marketing far and wide and bringing in students, signing up for these schools and getting the money. The students often don't stay, and uh, the churn is very high. Teacher-student ratios, uh, anywhere between 60 to 120 students per teacher, and uh, the, the <laughs> I could go on and on and on about these companies, and it's just incredible. I'm a believer in online instruction and also in hybrid schools. That is going to be the future, but this whole opportunity space is being defined by these pri private interest. And I know that you don't have uh, have those here yet, but I know that um, it's something that you'll probably be examining in in in, uh, in the in the near future. But the online schools are a great opportunity, but right now it's one of my greatest concerns uh, because of the way the schools are performing. And I, I believe they could perform better. Some states are trying to regulate saying, uh, you're not allowed to have 120 students per teacher. You have to have only 20 students per teacher. You know, you don't have a facility cost. You don't have transportation costs. You don't have a lot of the cost of a brick and mortar school. They should be able to have even lower uh, student teacher ratios. And yet they don't. Um, so some states are trying to regulate those things. I think that really what has, has to happen is we have to have a moratorium on that get some, uh, do some pilot studies, figure out how to make these schools work, because I believe they will, and then uh, implement them, you know, based on, on evidence of what is working. So those are my three biggest concerns, privatization, acceleration of segregation, and then uh, the online schools that are growing very rapidly across the nation.